Hello, friends. John Eldridge here. Welcome back to the Ransom Tart Podcast. Most of you are probably listening to this at home, and we just want to send our love and greetings to you all here in the week of April 13th. Before we jump into part two of how to tell your story and how to listen to someone else's story, we wanted to tell you about a couple of really neat things. First off, for the next two weeks on Tuesdays, so that would be the 14th of April and the 21st of April, Ransomed Heart is hosting a special Zoom conference, a live conference via the technology of Zoom, which everybody's using these days. And what we're doing is we're offering some hope, some inspiration, and a chance to connect via a small group experience. We had about Golly, almost 500 people join us for the first one last week. And then Stacy will be hosting the one on April 14th. And then I'll be back on April 21st for our conclusion on that. Stacy will be talking about Defiant Joy. And then what the Zoom technology allows you to do is to go into small groups and talk about it. So you're going to get to meet people from all over the world. Now, this time on the 14th and the 21st, we're actually going to do two different times that you can get on. And you do need to sign up for it at ransomedheart.com backslash Zoom. But there's a 12 noon mountain time and a 6 p.m. mountain time so we can accommodate different time zones around the world to join us. Hope you can. First week was really wonderful. Also wanted to let you know that next week we will probably drop in with a special COVID-19 pandemic conversation again. It's been several weeks since we've done that and things continue to change in the world. So look forward to that in the week of April 20. Okay, so here we go now into part two on how to tell your story, how to listen to someone else's. Friends, welcome to the Ransomed Heart Podcast. This is part two of a little mini-series we're doing here on how to care for people, how to love people well by listening well to their story, and how to tell your story. And the context is just assuming that in any good relationship, whether it's friendships or a band of brothers or sisters, certainly within a marriage and within small group settings, If you're going to care for people, if you're going to advocate for them, if you're simply even going to understand them, you need to hear their story. And we highly recommend that this is the beginning of or part of any small group experience. So, you know, maybe you're going to sit down with some folks and go through one of our small group video curriculum. But I would suggest either before you do that or when you're done, you also tell each other your story so that you really can love one another better. And it's not just an intellectual gathering. It's really heart-to-heart stuff. So having said that, welcome back to part two. Stacy Burton, Sam, Luke, and John Eldridge in here because we've all had such different good and bad small group experiences. And we were sitting around talking about this the other day. We wanted to share it with you. When we were riffing on this, Sam, you made a really fascinating observation. You said, let your body language mirror theirs. Mm -hmm. Why? Say something more about that. I thought that was fascinating. Yeah, well, these are things that actually make the speaker feel more at ease. And so if someone is leaning forward, clasping their hands, it'd actually be really good for you to not be reclining with your arms across your chest though that may feel very comfortable, the message you are sending to them is, I am not engaged, I am not present. However, if they are sitting back with a leg crossed, you might consider doing the same thing. I don't want you to get too in your head about trying to do it perfectly, but as you mirror them, it actually makes the person feel like you are in the same emotional wavelength. It feels like you are Mm. tracking. It feels like you are present. If you make little noises like Luke just made of, Mm, Mm -hmm. nodding, making eye contact. Mm -hmm. Like if you are staring at the floor the whole time someone's telling their story or you're checking your phone, if your phone is making noises, get out. Yep. Leave. No phones. No phones. Like you're out (laughs) of your mind. No phones. Oh, so the body language piece. Yeah. We had this practice in our group that we did. We were not allowed to hand someone a tissue. So In the moment of extreme emotion, we're all trying to be present. We're leaning forward. They're leaning forward. Active listening. There are tears. 
we were encouraged not to go for the tissue, not to reach a hand and put it on the knee, not to pull them out of the moment, essentially. What feels like has become so culturally, I'm going to take care of you, actually sends the message of get that buttoned up quickly. Mm-hmm. Like, here's a tissue, wipe your nose, yeah. clear up your eyes, move get on with it. together. Though it feels like empathy, you're, you're actually derailing them. And it's really, really hard to sit there as a listener and just sit in someone's tears and let this not go. And if they ask for tissues, then go. But like, well, oh. I think what's fascinating, I've talked to my women friends about not handing someone who's crying a tissue. And I totally understand the purpose behind that. However, the women in my life are like, that's just stupid. Like, I think the female spirit is like, I am going to take care of you. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to I'm gonna keep your face clean and your snot cleaned up. And yeah. you know. So have a box of tissues in the room. Yeah. Maybe put it on the table or put it before the person who's going. Yeah. It's available. Right. right. But what we're trying to convey is don't break the mood. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And also, don't be quick to pull people out of difficult spaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're going to give about 45 minutes to an hour for each person to tell their story in your group. Also allow at least 30 minutes for response time. Hopefully another hour. So it's kind of like, a you know, we're going 7 to 9 is our normal group time. And so you have an hour to tell your story and then comes very appropriate responses. And they range from, that is the saddest thing I've ever heard, or it may be, wow, are you aware that the whole time that you told us your story, you stared at your shoes? You never looked at us once. Like, oh, really? I did? Mm. How are you feeling right now? Or how were you feeling when you were telling your story? So there's this mm-hmm. beautiful response time. And may I suggest, e- even if you're going to ministry prayer, or what we would call a four streams time of like, let's break some agreements and, wow, we can sure see a, a, a father wound in there. Let's see if, you know, Christ can come. That's all good. But before that, it's just this caring for what just was given to you. This incredible gift was given to you, their vulnerability, their life story. That um, So at first, there are just good responding, like, Janet, thank you so much for that. Thank you. That um, we're so honored to hear your story. Mm. Yeah, that's really good. I would really encourage folks to use that first bit of response to then tease out the questions, to name the things, and not be afraid of sounding stupid. Like to the piece you said, Stacy, of going, "Thank you for that." Mm-hmm. You're not hijacking if it's pointed towards them, if it's honoring and tethering mm-hmm. them back to other people, mm-hmm. or if it's piece of like when you started talking about your mom were you aware that you were white knuckling it the whole time like those questions Mm. that's part of the response that's actually for me that is as important as the four stream stuff that's coming yeah to be able to flesh out more of that data and go this may sound stupid but there was some emotion when you were talking about that time in your life yeah can you take us back to that where was that coming from yeah i love the question of say more Mm-hmm. When you were talking about your mom, you pretty quickly shifted away from that thing that happened in third grade. Can you say a little bit more about that? I mean, if you notice something that feels like a huge life moment. So let's just name some things now. What what are you listening for? Someone's putting their story out there, and obviously if you've hung around the Ransom Heart vibe for any amount of time, you know that we're looking for father wounds. We're looking for mother wounds. Agreements. We're looking for agreements, and and by agreement, we mean sentences they are living under, things that were said to them that had a verdict to it, like, my dad was right, I'll never amount to anything. You go, whoa, that is a massive agreement. So I'm listening for dreams that they had as a, a child which they're more likely to admit then than they are now. Okay, this is really good because what we tend to listen for or look for is the tears. Mm -hmm. Where is the loss of heart? Mm -hmm. And that's big, right? Because this is a war for the human heart. But I love watching for when their face lights up. Yeah, Mm. that's so telling. Isn't it? I love watching for those moments. And sometimes it's just a little flicker Mm -hmm. in a story. Suddenly they light up like Mm -hmm. a light bulb. When they're done... You go, hey, 
can we go back to when your face lit up over? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you were saying dreams. For the dreams piece, you can kind of come at it from the positive or the negative because they're going to be pretty close. You're going to hear dreams of I always wanted to blank as a kid or I I loved X. And then you're going to hear the but probably pretty quickly or you're going to hear the ways that it played out. You're going to hear how that was come against. And so I listen for the dreams because they're a huge piece of data on how that was handled and where their heart comes alive and maybe even where some of their gifting and where they're supposed to be. So as they're like, and now I just hate my life. And you're like, well, it's because you're indoors all day and you actually have loved being outside working mm. with horses. So mm. yeah, mm. those pieces, the dreams, they're huge. And I think people are more likely to name them in their childhood than they are to name them currently. People dream of like five o'clock on a Friday these days. I know I do. (laughs) Another thing that I like to listen for is what messages about life they've learned. And I just think about like in every story coming up that life just sucks. Life's just hard. Yes. Or if I don't make it happen, it won't happen. Things like that. Yeah, those deep core beliefs. Mm -hmm. Just about what life is like. Yeah, and they'll say it too. Mm-hmm. They'll say it. I'm just remembering so many things I misdid as a young therapist. But <laughs> if they say it in the first seven minutes, don't pounce on it. Like it will come back around. I guarantee you, you'll get to it. Even if you don't get to it tonight, mm. it will come back around in your group. And so let's say they tell their story. You just see this underlying current of anger. It'll come back around. Trust me, if you don't get to it tonight, there's going to be three sessions from now, and they're going to do something that sounds really angry, and and you're going to be able to go, hey, Nate, can we come back to that anger thing? Because when you told your story three weeks ago, you just seemed really angry, and you seem really angry again tonight. What's the anger thing about? I mean, grace and mercy, Mm -hmm. it'll come back right. You don't have to pounce on these things. Yeah, right, because the idea is that you are hearing this in the context of a relationship, not a one-night emotional story stand. Yeah. There you and go. And therefore, like, this is going to be very helpful data. There you go. As you progress. Yeah. So for me, because this is couched in the ransom heart understanding of the heart, I'm listening for their poser. I'm listening for the ways that they have learned to navigate, and they might even be talking through it to just go, like, where's the real you? Am I encountering the real you? Or have you mm. drifted into something mm. that feels safe? Mm. I've seen on several occasions picking examples at random, a guy who feels very dismissed. And so he tells his whole story in a very dismissive way and partners with it. He's like, well, I deserve to be dismissed. Won't ever say that exact phrase. Won't be that obvious, but it'll be like, I did this and this and that and that and the other thing. And you're like, oh my gosh, like you are inviting us to partner with the dismissal of you. Or somebody else is just a bleeding martyr and the world is out to get them and it's making me sick. And I'm like, barely hanging on for the rest of the story because I just want to get that out of the way. But I'm encountering that wound slash pose and I'm watching for it. And I'm also needing to be aware that they're inviting me to see them in that as well. They're going to paint their story the way that they have Mm. learned to read their story. We've really been encouraging people to not jump in and try and solve. We are also advocating for four streams coming as part of the listening experience. I'm so aware of those moments right after a story is shared and we have that invitation to either partner with or contend for the freedom of the person who just shared their story. Mm -hmm. And I say partner with because partnering is often with the wounding. Partnering is with not being seen. Mm -hmm. And it feels like jujitsu sometimes to do it well because I have been so missed by somebody coming in with their one skill that is like quoting Bible verses at me or going straight to something without more curiosity. Yeah, And it feels like you can even get baited into responding to the warfare, the the gravitational well of my story or someone else's story as you try and help them. There's this moment of, oh, you're so angry. And if you would only just understand that you are a son and you're like, why am I yelling at this person all of (laughs) a sudden? So it's just like there's some mercy as you're shifting and trying to move towards the long-term walk with this person. Like you're going to be picking up on stuff in that really like that transition space. Okay. Just check your motives. 
That'll help you. Just check your modus right now. You eager to get the evening over? Let's just button this up. You just so aggravated this person because they won't see the truth and agree with it. You, you know, you frustrated. Just check your motives because love covers a multitude of sins. If you do it in love, if your response is truly out of love, even if it's not great, it'll be so covered with grace um, because your motive's good. Also, admit the awkwardness. You can say, you know what? I'm not a counselor, and I'm, I'm not even sure that all that I'm feeling right now is true. But when I was listening to your story, I sure heard this. And then you can name the pattern that you heard. You mm-hmm. sure seem to say, that was dumb a lot. Nobody gets me a lot. Just go ahead and preface it mm-hmm. with, oh, look, I'm not a pro at this, and I just want to love well. I may not say this right, but here's what I'm seeing. That's okay, gang. This isn't about perfection. John, I think that is so good because that is regularly my experience in groups. I'm so worried about doing more harm that I really feel Jesus is giving me something to say to them, but I'm so afraid to speak up that I won't offer. And that feels like a huge miss where Jesus is wanting to use me. So I love that you said that. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's real. Yeah. And I'm also, gosh, this series could be 16 parts and we could do a thing on leading groups because when we started out, we talked about creating the good Mm -hmm. environment, but you also, whoever's leading, you kind of need to land this thing well too. And so if you do have the encourager that just jumps straight in with, that is just not true. You're a daughter. (laughs) You're loved. You're beautiful. Everyone in this room thinks you're beautiful. Go. Sit down, Kathy. What you just said, Kathy. I love your encouragement. Thanks for being an encouragement. But I think what we want to do right now is actually pray. Yeah, that's a better response. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So one thing we didn't even mention is when you're getting started, by all means, pray Mm -hmm. over it and just say, hey, you know, before Kevin shares his story tonight, let's just pray because, of course, this is going to be opposed. Any movement towards love healing, redemption is opposed. I guarantee you. And it's going to be the knock at the door or it's going to, you know, be the checked out person or whatever. You know, the the person who's trying to tell their story is normally really clear and lucid, but they can't string two sentences together tonight. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've seen that happen all the time where it, the person's up to bat and they just feel really confused and it feels like them. Yeah. And like that's actually... A moment where intervening and stopping the story is really helpful. Probably kind. Like, don't let that thing keep going because you're just, there are moments where you could be leaving them in mm-hmm. the warfare and yeah. actually it'd be a really helpful exercise as a group to contend and be like, yeah. whoa, 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 there's some confusion going on that's not from you. Yeah. We need to, we need to get that off so we can hear your story. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So start it with prayer, consecrate it. We bring this under your love, Jesus. We surround this with your protection and your kingdom. We bind away every form of the enemy that would try and get in, and we just pray for a safe environment, you know, something like that. I mean, you mm-hmm. consecrate it, you pray, protect it. Also, not forcing them to go anywhere they don't want to go. Mm. Um, oh, that's huge. Yeah. Say more. Yeah, say more. As people tell their story, Jesus may be bringing up something that is very traumatic. They may or may not realize they said it out loud. And it could be devastating if you push into them needing to share it in this moment if they don't feel safe or if they're just not prepared, if they're almost surprised of what arose. Mm. It would be very unkind Mm. to force them into that. And as John said, when they are ready, it'll come back around. It'll come back around. And don't take it as a verdict on the group that they don't, want to go there. They don't want to go there. Yeah. No, it's really respectful. Oh, mm-hmm. my gosh. If they don't want to go there, you're not going there, gang. You Let it go. Yeah. Let it go. Even if it's the key, and it so is often I the know, key. You're the like, key, if you and would so just obvious. listen to me, I can fix <laughs> yeah. this. You're like, no, actually, it's Jesus <laughs> yeah. that fixes it. One of the things for me, and this is like more detail-y, but as I'm listening and as, as the story is coming to a close, I'm often really intrigued by where memory should be and isn't. So if someone's telling their story and they move really quickly through certain things, a childhood, a relationship, particularly like big things like their father or love, and they're just 
they're fuzzy there and they kind of they kind of go quickly. That to me is really intriguing. Mm-hmm. And partly because mm. that is an effect of trauma to have memory feel degraded. And partly because those are such big moments and defining moments in the story that you're like, what well, your life took a dramatic shift, but you don't know why. Can you just be curious? Yeah. And not go something wrong with you for mm. not knowing what that is. But mm. can you ask that person in genuine curiosity? Mm. Can you go there? Are there things mm-hmm. there? Were you not feeling safe in this space to offer? Or are you curious as to why you don't remember having a conversation mm-hmm. with your father? Like that actually has a lot of weight. The absence of things can have a lot of weight in someone's story as much as the presence of things. Mm. Yeah, just to return to things to listen for when they're telling their story, what they've learned about God. Is there anger there? Is there hatred there? Accusation, I think that's going to say a lot. Huge abandonment, mm-hmm. betrayal. Oh my goodness. I've been in situations where just naming it and just saying, wow, you sound like God has forsaken you. Mm. <sighs> you know, and then it's just the tears. And again, you just unlock some beautiful thing for redemption there, paying attention to what they think of God or what their story taught them to think of God. Mm-hmm. That's really good. Yeah, also listening for when they lost heart and their story, which probably going to be around the dreams that you're listening for, childhood that you're listening for. At what moment did they lose heart in their own story? Well, I, I'm also curious when that happens in the people around them. So a, a gal was telling her story, and she threw out this line that I'll never forget where she was saying, my dad used to be a geologist. Now he sells furniture. Mm-hmm. But it was about her childhood. And for me, that was that was a sentence that speaks of so much losing of heart and changing of trajectories. And that's her father. So she's able to like watch that. And I'm going, oh, man, the, the influence of other people losing heart in your family or in your world. Like mm-hmm. I, that to me was like this little ding. Went up and I know, and we're not trying to give a counseling degree crash program here. However, Carl Jung believed that the greatest psychological impact of a parent on a child was the unlived life of the parent. Hmm. Isn't that fascinating? So it's the lost dreams of the parent, it's the resignation because they can't hmm. be present. They're not loving, engaging, playful, dreaming. Hey, what do you want to do? Where's our family going this year? Because somewhere along the way, They lost heart. Mm. That has a huge impact as well. I want to circle back to something Stacey was saying about don't force people to go where they don't want to go. You can ask. You can say, hey, you had a lot of tears around seventh grade. It seems like something pretty significant happened there. Do you you want to say some more about that to us? And if she says no, you go, all right, we totally respect that. Like you can ask. The wonderful, wonderful tool is your conversational intimacy with Jesus. Mm -hmm. Like you asking Jesus, do you want me to bring that up, Lord? Like internally, Yeah. right? That's good. Oh, it's so helpful because one of the dangers is that you will see stuff. You'll go, oh my gosh, this guy has got such massive agreements Mm -hmm. around, you know, such and such. And you go, I am so ready to go there. And you ask Jesus, are we going there tonight? And Jesus goes, not tonight. And you got to let it go. It's the same thing of don't force them to go there. You also got to make sure God is or isn't going. Where are you going, Lord? And, mm-hmm. and so either as they're telling their story or especially in, you're in the response time, and maybe you're ready to pray and go, this person has a massive spirit of shame on them. It is so glaring. Jesus, can we go after it? And just quietly in your heart, you're asking Jesus. They may not be ready for that, Mm -hmm. and it may not go well. And so you really do have to check in with God. Well, yeah, and the the reverse is also true because this is a unique environment. You're not not in the same parameters as a counseling environment. You actually get to listen to God and ask some crazier questions. And there's been times where I listen to someone's story— and he's been like, ask them why they hate me. And I'm like, but they didn't say that. And they were actually pretty fine with you. And I don't, that's oh, a really wow. awkward question to ask. I don't really <laughs> yeah. feel like doing that. I'm like, well, so I, I haven't couched it as like, I just heard the voice of God. And now you have to respond to this question, but I'll just be prompted to go, how do you feel? I feel like you might hate God, though you didn't say that. And then they may reveal some more cards and it can be really helpful mm-hmm. data. 
it actually takes the pressure off of you because the Holy Spirit will give it to you rather totally. than you needing to have totally. 20 years of experience here. Totally. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Trust your walk with God there. He's intentional and can be so playful. Very playful yeah. in what he'll have you ask. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, just as their story ends and they're getting up to the current moment, thinking about, okay, how is their current life a result of their story, both in goodness, but then also in frustration? You know, thinking about, okay, what are the consequences of their story in the mm. current moment? Mm. Yeah. I mean, you, you heard their childhood dream of being a cartoonist, right? Or an artist. And you know that there is nothing in their world right now that involves that. You could ask about that. Do you miss drawing? Do mm -hmm. you wish you were doing it now? And just a simple question could be really beautiful. Oh, into the current moment, like, there's been times where I've needed to ask myself what kind of story was just shared right now. There have been stories I've heard that are victory stories where it's like I'm, I'm moving in this direction and I've just experienced a lot of breakthrough and I'm so excited. And therefore, your response is going to be very different. Like you actually get to go straight into toasting and cheersing yeah. rather than needing to go into some of those traumatic questions. Yes. And there have been stories that are more in process and people want to jump right to the toasting thing. And I'm like, ooh, very inappropriate. Like we did not hear that kind of a story. That's not where they are. And so our response at the end needs to be different. Match emotion for emotion. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Match emotion for emotion. We've talked about awkward pauses, awkward silences. You got to be comfortable with awkward silences. It, you may sit there for a few minutes while somebody tries to explain something from their past or while they're just sitting in a hard emotion and they're, they're trying to gather themselves up, like, let it sit there. It's okay. And then when the story's done being told, it may be very respectful to just sit with it for a moment and say, let's, let's just honor this. Just a quiet moment of, whoa. Yeah, I go to how respectful that could be to, to name, that was really heavy. Can we sit with you in this for a moment? Mm. Yeah. And then let it be a space. Because if there's nothing said and yeah, there's yeah, just dead air for yeah. 60 mm -hmm. seconds, I'm like, and I'm <laughs> going to leave now. Yeah. But similarly, after the story's been told, there needs to be a response. And sometimes that silence, after the response and questions and teasing and prayer has happened, as the evening is almost done, I want to come back to that person and go, as we leave tonight, how are you feeling? Knowing that this is in process. Thank you. Knowing yeah. that there's more to come. That Thank we you. That have Good. solved everything. Thank you. How are you doing walking out the door? Because yeah. that will affect how we pray. Like some, They yeah. may be pissed. They may feel missed. We may yeah. have successfully joined in partnering with yeah. the wrong thing. And to go, okay, as you go, mm -hmm. how are you going? Yeah, that's really yeah. good. Now, gang, obviously— it's a whole nother series on how to bring the ministry of Christ to someone having heard their story. And we have audio on that, and it's called The Four Streams, and that's available on the tribe. There's a lot of teaching on that through all the Ransomed Heart stuff, but that's not what this series is about. So um, this, you know, we're talking about bringing the evening in for a landing and the prayer and the ministry time. That in itself is rich and beautiful and phenomenal, and it might be inner healing, and it might be deliverance, and it might be words from God and breaking of agreements, or, you know, just the love of Jesus being ministered to them in prayer. All really wonderful. Not going to cover it here, not what this podcast series is about. So, you know, as you're wrapping up your evening, Stace, I think you have a great point about that. Yes. So as you leave the evening, a really important piece of the evening is to release everyone and everything to God. A great way to do this is to pray, God, I bring your cross and your blood between me and everyone tonight, between everyone's story. It is his protection that'll come, and the enemy's going to want to come in and just really have his way with what happened that night. And so to, again, release everything and everyone to you, God, I bring your blood and your cross, and I bless everyone. You do it in love, and you do it in blessing. Yeah, that's really God's good. God's protection. You know, because the warfare piece is something else we can't unpack here, and it's partly in the Four Streams uh, series on the tribe, but just to be aware of, their warfare will try and prevent you from intervening. And so their warfare will come against you before you get there, if it's an intervening kind of a night, 
they're worth will try and jump on you when you leave. And so we keep the cross of Christ, Galatians 6, 14. The cross changes every human relationship, every relationship. So we just, in love, we keep the cross of Christ between us and all people. Just because I'm a checklist type person, like, I think this Chuckless? was... Chucklist? <laughs> you, don't, you don't give any checks? I love checklists. Checklist. <laughs> Am I not saying it right? No. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> no, you're not. I'm not feeling heard right now. Uh oh. <laughs> We're a little too heard. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Overly examined. I'm sorry. My point is this was like an amazing wealth of information. And I also think at the end of the day, anybody just wants to be listened to. Mm. So if you're in a group and someone's telling their story, like if you do anything, I feel. Listen to them with intention. Yeah, that's it. And as Sam said, like, it takes time to learn it. I know, I know, I know. We may be raising more questions than we're answering. I hope not. But this is going to conclude part two of how to listen. And next time when we're together, we're going to turn it around and offer some thoughts on how to tell your story, how to be ready and prepared to tell your story well.